My wing for slumber, America, land of brave and true. With castles and clothing and food for all, all belongs to you. Every man Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of American Rambler. I'm your host, Colin Woodward. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's show, I have Robert Mann. He has a new book out. It is called Backrooms and Bayous, My Life in Louisiana Politics. Bob worked for a long time as a political consultant and PR guy. He's worked with senators and governors and seen a lot of the more prominent races in Louisiana history, at least in the late 20th century early 21st century. He has seen a lot, and Bob has been recognized for his work. He is in the Louisiana Political Hall of Fame. He was inducted in 2014, so that's pretty cool. He's the author of a number of books, uh, including a book on Vietnam, and he has a book coming out on Huey Long and LSU. It'll be coming out next year. So he stays busy writing and teaching at LSU at the Manship School, and This is really, I think, the first podcast I've done that really gets into Louisiana politics and Louisiana history post-war. I went to LSU, got my Ph.D. there. Sometimes I get nostalgic for Louisiana, especially my days in New Orleans and being ABD at LSU and researching and writing. And Louisiana certainly has a colorful history, a colorful political landscape sometimes maybe a little too colorful because you get politicians who really like to be kind of buffoonish. And you know that, that certainly didn't start with Huey Long, but uh, he was the first modern politician in Louisiana, one who used mass media, the radio, uh, and was able to do some very good things for Louisiana, but also set a precedent for some not so great things. He did build the Capitol and Roads and was very important in LSU's history in the 1920s and 30s. But he was kind of one of those Trump before Trump guys that had a huge ego, was dictatorial, and not necessarily good for the state. Although he was very adept at theater, and uh, there was one moment where one of his aides was talking about his Every Man a King program where he was going to uh, tax. Anyone who made a million dollars or above at a high rate, and one of his aides said, well, uh, you know, that means anyone who makes less than a million dollars isn't going to have to pay any taxes. So if you made $999,999, you wouldn't pay. Uh, And Huey Long said something to the effect of, well, by the time they figure out the the economics of that, we'll, we'll be on to the next thing. So if you study Louisiana history, you can certainly relate a lot of it to what we've been going through in the last uh, at least four or five years, but even in the last 20 and the political turn we've taken here. It was fun to talk with Bob about Louisiana politics and certain figures like David Duke, who are still around, um, but were nationally known for a while. And, and Duke was a and is a horrible racist. He's just one of the many characters in the rogues gallery, uh, among them Edwin Edwards, who went to prison, Ray Nagin, who went to prison, uh, Duke went to prison, and so on and so forth. And I don't know if Louisiana generally is more corrupt than other states. I'm not sure if you broke it down, uh, how much worse it would be from, from other places. But it certainly has that reputation, and there certainly are a number of high-profile people who've who've gone to prison for... Uh, their corruption and their dishonesty in Louisiana. So gives historians a lot to talk about and gives us a lot to talk about. And I really enjoyed reading Bob's book. Gives you an inside look at the politics of the time, Republican and Democrat, because Bob started out as a Republican and then shifted over to the Democratic Party. Like a lot of people and people who I talk to on this podcast and have been saying this for years now, is a little worried about the political state of things. I mean, I certainly am. Maybe not as bad since Biden took office. Uh, For the progressives, I don't worry quite as much as I was in 
2019 and 2020, but things are still really bad and there's still a lot of fear and anxiety about the future. Bob is is worried and he has seen a lot, so I certainly take that seriously and it was uh, good to get his feedback on certain things. But what we do essentially here is give you kind of a tour of Louisiana politics since Bob has been writing about it and working on it. My talk with Robert Mann. And so it's been out how long now? Um, it's been a little over a month now, officially. Yep. August All right. 9th is the official pub date. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to plug it. Backrooms and Bayous, My Life in Louisiana Politics. And I've, I've got to say, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, it was well much. written. It, it moved along really well. And you've had an interesting career in politics. And I, I think it's safe to say one of the most colorful states in the country <laughs> on its own, but also politically. So we'll, we'll just jump right into it. You are a Louisiana guy, but uh, if you want to tell the folks, could just kind of talk about where you're, where you're from, what your background is in, in Louisiana. Well, I, you know, I was born and raised, sort of raised in Beaumont, Texas, right across the Louisiana border, um, very much culturally like South Louisiana and over there in Beaumont, a lot of um, a lot of uh, Louisiana Cajun refugees washed up in Beaumont, working in the oil and gas industry and in other. So I, I grew up around a lot of Louisianians. Yeah. And um, not long after, you know, we we moved to um, when I was when I was a teenager, we moved to we moved to Shreveport, and then my dad was a preacher, and we moved around a bit. But we we wound up in in Louisiana when I graduated high school in Leesville, where he also had a church. Okay. And, you know, since my early years, since my teens, I've been I've been a Louisiana kid and always lived here since then, except for my eight years that I lived in, in D.C. Leesville named after Robert E. Lee? I believe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. His shadow falls long over the country <laughs> in places really that I'm, sh- I'm I'm guessing he never passed through Leesville at any point in his life. I don't know. Uh, no, I don't but... think so. But you know who did was uh, Aaron Burr. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, you know, he fled to an area in this that was the sort of that no man's land between Texas and and Louisiana. And there's actually a little a little bitty wide spot in the road right on in, in Vernon Parish, right near the Texas Louisiana border called Burr Ferry, named after Burr. Oh, yeah. It, it isn't amazing the things you can do in this country still have something named after you. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Aaron <laughs> right. Burr. Quite, quite a, a character, quite a figure. Well, and if people that don't know, I mean, I think the geography, when you're talking about Beaumont, you're talking about West Texas, it still feels a lot like Louisiana, don't you think, when you're kind of heading that direction? Yeah, because you go from, uh, if you, you go uh, west of Lake of Lafayette, you're in that sort of uh, coastal plain, uh, prairie area. And, it, you know, you if you drive from Lake really Lafayette through Lake Charles across the, uh, the Sabine river into Beaumont and, and beyond Beaumont. It looks, you, you open your eyes, you know, take a nap, you wake up, you're not really sure where you are. Cause it all looks the same between Lafayette and, and, uh, and Houston pretty much. So it's, it's, yeah. it's so, uh, geographically, but also culturally. I mean that, you know, there's a lot of Louisiana people, as you know, who live in, in Beaumont and Houston and it's, it's, it's people just sort of flow back and forth across that border. Yeah, and in Houston, I mean, I've only been there a couple of times, but it kind of does feel like a much bigger version of Baton Rouge in a lot of ways. Very flat, obviously hot, humid. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, geographically, is it's very, very similar. Talk about kind of how you got into politics. Uh, you were, I mean, you've always been a writer. Maybe sort of talk about how you got on that journey. Yeah, you know, I, I grew up in a family that was politically aware, not so much active, but politically aware. My my mother especially was one of those people that loved writing letters to the local congressman who happened to be a, a, a good friend of my grandfather. And so uh, he would always respond to her in good humor, probably maybe more than she deserved for some of these letters she sent to him accusing the Democratic Party of, of leaning toward becoming socialist and all of that. But um, you know, I thought it was interesting, and my mo- I thought it was interesting. My mother could write the congressman Jack Brooks, by the way, who was uh, in a 
pretty legendary uh, Texas congressman who's very close to Lyndon Johnson, uh, supposedly the only person that Lyndon Johnson was actually afraid of, um, who wouldn't talk, <laughs> you know, who could talk back to Johnson and get away with it. But oh yeah, but um, I was just fascinated by the fact that my mother could write these letters and get get a response, and so it just sort of piqued my interest. And I was always, you know, I was just interested in politics. And God bless my parents. Um, they weren't, uh, I think they were sort of alarmed at my interest in politics in a way, because they maybe were afraid that what would happen did happen, you know, that, that I would go into politics in some way, but they indulged it. They, they saw an interest in me and they didn't try to squelch it. And, and I, they didn't, they weren't stage parents or anything, but they were, they indulged it. And so I, you know, they would take me to a political rally. We subscribed to several newspapers when I wanted a book or something, um, they would buy it. And so I was, I was indulged in that way, and I'm I'm very grateful for it. So I just, you know, as I when I went into when I was in college, I got involved in a couple of political campaigns and uh, just gravitated toward journalism um, because I loved writing and I loved public affairs, and it was it seemed just sort of the natural thing to do. And um, and so you know that sort of led me into political journalism, which eventually led me into politics. Is sort of the, the short story. And remind me again, kind of like, when are you coming of age? What time period exactly? You just mentioned Johnson. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So I was born in um, 1958. So growing up in the 60s um, and, you know, in the civil rights era, um, you know, it was really interesting because I, I, what, I, I one of the things I neglected to mention was that my mother's writing to these members of Congress sort of sparked in me the desire to start an autograph collection. So I realized that if, you know, a kid, especially if a kid writes a member of Congress or a celebrity or whatever, and that they, they will respond to you. And so I would, I would just write all kinds of politicians and get all, all these letters back and sign photographs. And, um, and um, you know, so that I would write people like Hubert Humphrey and uh, George Wallace. I mean, it, it, I was sort of ecumenical in that way. I didn't really, I wasn't really leaning toward one or the other. Ronald Reagan. I mean, I wrote, I wrote J. Yeah. Edgar Hoover. When when somebody would die, like when Dwight Eisenhower <laughs> died, I sent Mamie a, a you know a little note of condolence, and I got this nice little card back from her. And it's just stuff like that. And it just really was it was kind of cool. Like I, I felt like I you know I'm I'm friends with these people, you know. And it just really piqued my interest in 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 a life of in a life of politics. Yeah, I you know I don't want to say necessarily sort of born into politics but you you obviously had this mindset early on um and i mean it's good that your parents they'd, they'd write letters and stuff like that i was kind of in one of those families where if you had an opinion you'd you'd write to not necessarily politics but just uh whatever uh and and, and that's good practice but you started out um i mean you just mentioned wallace i mean you weren't necessarily like a in his world politically, but you were more conservative early on in your life. Yes, I was. And, and, you know, and I, my parents were big Wallace supporters. And so I, so was I, you know, for, yeah. I, I thought he was great. And uh, I still have a personalized let, uh, autograph, a uh, photograph that he, you know, he signed for me in, in 1968, something like that. And when he was shot, I write in the book that when he was shot um, uh, that, that day in 1972, my mother came and picked me up from, from school to break the news from me because that's how what a sort of a fan disciple of this guy I was and I was very upset and I write in the book this this the story that that's that's still one of the more sort of a, a a formative experience in my early life was when I got a call that afternoon from a from one of my teachers Miss Edie Marion Edie who was an African American woman who knew how much I loved George Wallace. I was stupidly talking about him to her and she somehow tolerated me being this disciple of this, you know, America's most famous racist. And yeah. she called me on the phone at home that afternoon and told me how sorry she was. And she was thinking about me because she knew how much I admired this man. And, and at the time it meant nothing. It, you know, it was, it was a nice thing, but it, I didn't comprehend the enormity of that phone call and what it meant for her to do that. And, you know, I've written about it in, on, in the book in another place in a column that I wrote many years ago in the New Orleans paper about, holy smokes, what it must have taken for that woman to pick up the phone and make that phone call. What a what a what a generous act of grace and and how I wish I had been a little bit smarter, a little bit older, a little bit wiser to to realize what she was doing. And I never really got to thank her. I've tried to find her. I don't I can't I can't find her anywhere. 
and I, cause I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to acknowledge it in my, in my adulthood, what she had done. And I just have never been able to track her down. Yeah. No, that, that's not an easy thing to do. And for people nowadays, I mean, if you didn't live through the Wallace period, or maybe if you don't study history, I'm not sure how much, and maybe it's a good thing. I'm not sure how much importance he has in kind of the public mind right now. I mean, I think when Trump first came on the scene, if you knew something about American history, you'd say, well, there's definitely Wallace uh, comparisons here. Um, but I I think, yeah, it's his, his legacy is getting maybe a bit dimmer, but I think a lot of things that he stood for certainly are still here. And I don't want to get down the Wallace rabbit hole necessarily, but he did have an interesting trajectory because he did start fairly progressive for a judge in Alabama, but then kind of embraced the race um, issue. But towards the end of his career, he had something of a, uh, <laughs> I don't know, a reconciliation or whatever you want to call it, where he was able to win the majority of the black vote in Alabama. I know there are reasons why um, for that, but definitely had an interesting career. And I think he actually maybe won Louisiana in 68, didn't he? He did. Yeah. Uh, he won a few states. states. He carried, yeah. Mm-hmm. So he was a big deal then. And so you're kind of writing, you're reporting. Um, and we talk a little bit about, about college and kind of, again, this transition for you from someone who's kind of conservative into someone who's, mm-hmm. who's more liberal. Well, you know, like, um, like a lot of young people, I, I got to college. And I grew up parroting my parents' political views. I mean, I lived in yeah. their house. They, they fed me. They trained me. They, I was looking. I looked at the world through their eyes. It's not unusual. I see it in my students, a lot of my students, a lot. Not exclusively, but it's not unusual. And I get to college uh, and you just get away from their influence. It's not even, I don't think it's even necessarily takes college for this to happen. You just, you know, you just move out of their house and suddenly you're, you know, you're hearing other views and and hopefully you've moved to someplace maybe a little more diverse than Beaumont, Texas, you know. But uh, for me, it was Monroe, Louisiana, which is not really a bastion of, of liberalism or, or anything like that. But I went no. to school there at Northeast, then Northeast Louisiana University, now the ULM, University of Louisiana Monroe. And I had some, you know, I did, these weren't, these weren't raving liberal professors, but they were people who respected other views and who taught me how to think, you know, I, and I write about one of them was, was Dave Norris, who was my economics professor, who at the time when I was taking his class, he was running for mayor of West Monroe, a little small town on the, in Washtenaw Parish there across the Washtenaw River from Monroe. And he served as mayor for, for 40 years and um, became um, not only, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine, but really one of my mentors and somebody who opened my eyes to a lot. And one of the things that I write about in the book that he opened my eyes to was um to take a, ch- a kinder, gentler, more charitable view toward those who are who who find themselves in need of public assistance in some way, and he challenged me to think about it differently. And um, I ended up for a story when I was a, a journalist there, working at the, at the Monroe paper, the daily paper there. I went and spent a morning sitting in the welfare, the local quote unquote welfare office, and just observing people coming in and, and talking to them and hearing about their plight and realizing that these were very, people very much like me, who that there wasn't a whole lot of difference between me and them, that my family was not very well off. And we had periods of of really poverty that I didn't, you know, I didn't realize looking back on it now, I realize how how poor and how how hard it was to scrape together what my parents needed to, to raise me and my brother and sister and feed us and clothe us and all that and how difficult and stressful it was. They she, shielded us from a lot of that. But I realized these are these are people just like my parents and it people like dave dave norris opened my eyes and 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 i i really i still he's still one of my dearest friends one of my people i respect most in life and i thank him all the time for being one of those people who helped um help broaden my my perspective and open my eyes to a different way of looking at the world yeah well and to oversimplify in louisiana i mean the politics toward the north tend to trend more conservative in the politics to the South, more democratic um, because of the cities, Baton Rouge, uh, New Orleans. So kind of where you're growing up, I mean, I'd say it's about as conservative as it gets, right? In in the U S obviously there are exceptions to that. And 
that you had this mentor that was able to, you know, have empathy towards people who, who aren't as well off. I mean, I think that's a, that's a pretty important thing. Certainly we could use more of that now. Um, I think so obviously you were never like a dyed in the wool, like Republican. I mean, there's, well, I there's, was, you know, well, I, I, yeah, well okay. Well, yeah, I think I was, I would, yeah. I, would, I would say that I would say that I was <laughs> at, that, at that point. Yeah. And so is it, I, I mean, again, is it kind of a gradual process um, yeah. that maybe yeah. does that sort of, is that kind of complete by the time you get to DC? Do you think? Um, yeah, close to being complete. I think what, you know, honestly, it was people like Dave and others. It was, having a liberal arts education, even at a place like Northeast Louisiana University, not yeah. Harvard, or, not Harvard or Berkeley by any stretch, but, but it was, but I think for, for me, it was journalism going into journalism. And, you know, if you're a journalist, you're going to be spending your time around a lot of people who are, who are, you know, worse off than you. And you're going to be delving into their lives and listening to their stories. And if you've got any compassion at all, you're going to have some empathy for them. If you're listening, you're going to have empathy or, you know, or you're something wrong with you. And I think that, I think it just gradually sort of, um, softened my heart a little bit toward people. And, um, and I write in the book about, I, even when I went to Washington to work for Russell Long, uh, I wasn't really, didn't really consider myself a quote unquote liberal Democrat at that point, even though I was working for a Democrat. Um, it was seeing, yeah. up close and personal, the behavior of some of the Republicans on Capitol Hill and how disdainful they were toward the poor that really finally pushed me over the edge and said, OK, I can't I can't associate myself with this party anymore. Yeah, well, and I think, too, working with someone like Russell Long, who was a Democrat, and you're kind of talking about a Southern Democrat who had a pretty sketchy civil rights mm -hmm. uh, uh, history in, in terms of voting on legislation and things. You can, yeah, maybe kind of Kind of talk about that in terms of, um, you know, who Russell Long was, uh, how did you end up working with him kind of in, in when you finally get to D.C., like what what that whole process about? Yeah, you know, I, I tell this to students sometimes is, you know, that, that sometimes jobs, you don't look for jobs, they come looking for you, be open to those opportunities that just sort of fall into your lap. And this was this was for me. I was working at, at the Shreveport Journal as the political writer. I had covered the 1983 governor's race and and had a great time. And then 1984 comes along and I'm doing some other, some other stories. And Edwin Edwards, whose race I had covered in 83, um, the governor at the time uh, is, in, is indicted. Uh, he's eventually acquitted, but he's indicted for, um, by, in, 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 by a federal prosecutor in New Orleans. And uh, one of his defense attorneys was a guy, was a guy in Washington, DC. And my editor, Stan Tyner said, I want you to go to Washington and do a, and interview this guy and find out who he is. And let's do a let's do a big feature story on Edwards' defense attorney. So I go up to Washington in November and interview the guy and some other people ask about him. And and while I was there, I realized that Daryl Owen, who was um, the chief of staff to Senator Bennett Johnston, Russell Long's junior colleague in the Senate, was uh, a Shreveport native. And I thought, well, while I'm here, I'll go interview Daryl, do a little profile on this Shreveport kid who's helping a U.S. senator run his office and. Uh, so I go interview Daryl, and after the interview's over, he says, "Hey, did you know that uh, Russell Long is looking for a press secretary? Rafael Bermudez, who was who was had been the press secretary, has left. And did you know that that Russell's looking for a press secretary? I, I didn't know that. He said, "Well, would you be interested in that job?" And I said, "Yeah, I guess. You know, I mean, I don't, I'm not really sure what a press secretary does. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just so stupid." And so. I was, uh, they had no business hiring me, by the way. Let me just stipulate that from the beginning. I didn't know what the <laughs> hell I was doing. But yeah. hey, I'm in Russell Long's office interviewing for this job. And uh, two weeks later, Russell Long comes to Shreveport and we go and have coffee and he interviews me. And three or four weeks later, they call and offer me the, the job and I'm living in Washington. And it was just, I mean, it was just one of those things where just sort of, I didn't go looking for this job, it just sort of fell in my lap and um, it changed my life. And um, I'm really happy that, I mean, I, I, Fell in love with Russell Long, uh, he, a wonderful man. I ended up writing my first book about him, as you know, and and we got to know each other really well. And uh, you know, this living Louisiana legend, son of Huey Long, and the the first one of the first things that I had to do for him was he wanted to write, a, he wanted to to compose a speech that he would deliver in the in the Senate on the fiftieth, marking the fiftieth anniversary of his father's assassination in September of nineteen thirty five, and he asked me to write the speech for him or help him write the speech. And I was just 
I said, Senator, I, you know, how do I write a speech about your father? And uh, we came up with, I had this idea that I knew how to interview him. I'd interviewed him before and I'm pretty good at interviewing. So I just said, why don't I interview you about your father? And we'll just sit down for four or five hours and I'll just interview you. And so over two or three weeks or a month or two, I just sit down and interview him about his, about his, I would just sit around talking to Russell Long about Yui Long and they were paying me to do this. <laughs> and it was, yeah. you know, I helped him massage this into the speech. And, you know, it was just like, I was pinching myself every day. Like, how did I, how did I stumble into this incredible job where I get to, they pay me to talk with Russell Long about Yui Long. <laughs> well, those are the best kind of jobs, the ones that yeah. find you. Um, yeah. What did you know about him before you started working with him? Other, you know, other than some basics, would you know? I didn't know much. I mean, that's funny. I didn't know. You know, I'd, I'd interviewed him a few times. I have this picture that's uh, that's in the book of me interviewing him in the office of the mayor of Monroe when I was working for the Monroe paper in eighty one or eighty two. Um, and I'd interviewed him, I'd been around him a couple of times. And I, you know, honestly, Russell, Russell Long, it's kind of like Joe Biden. He had a stuttering problem as a kid and he still kind of okay. stuttered and he kind of mumbled. Senator Long kind of mumbled a little bit, kind of, I don't know. He just, he, he didn't, he didn't impress you when you would meet him. You wouldn't say now this is a brilliant man. Um, there was a sort of an all, all shucks, um, this deceptive quality, you know, this, and, and I, I guess I thought, oh, this is a guy who has been, you know, who's only in office because he was Yui Long's son. He didn't really have a lot going for him. And man, when I went to, yeah. I get to work for this guy and I realized he is, he's brilliant. I mean, he's one of the, he's really one of the smartest people I ever knew. He just had a mind like a computer. He had a photographic memory, by the way. He had a photographic memory. Oh, yeah. And a mind yeah. like, I've never seen anybody like that. And he had just, he was just a font of, of crazy ideas, but also brilliant ideas. He was always thinking, always talking, always just conjuring up policy ideas. You'd ride around the car with him in Louisiana, those before the days of cell phones. So there wasn't anybody to talk to, but me and whoever else was in the car. And he would just spin out these incredible ideas for how to change the tax code to create a better society, you know? And it was just, it was, he was a fascinating, brilliant, interesting guy. And I'm really, God, I'm just so blessed to have known him. Now you, you were teaching this semester, you've taught for a while, what do your store? What do your students know about Huey Long? Kind of the Long legacy. The, obviously, Russell Long being his son, being his senator, but also mm -hmm. you have you have Earl Long, who is governor. What do they know going into college about them? I don't know that they know anything really, and I, and it's yeah. not something that I teach because I don't teach political history. I'm teaching political writing, you know, writing about politics. So we don't. I mean, Huey Long never comes up. In they my don't class. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, maybe over in the history department, I know they, you know, you take Louisiana uh, history, you, you learn about Huey and Earl and Russell and all of that. But in my classes, they don't. But, um, okay. so I don't, you know, I don't know. I'd love to know what, what the, what the level of political history um, knowledge is on this campus. Um, I mean, there's the Huey Long Fieldhouse. So they see his right. name. There's right. a statue of Russell Long in front of the loss center. And, okay. um, you know, there's Huey Long's tomb in front of the Capitol. So, you you know, you you got to you got to close your eyes to sort of ignore the name around here. But they probably don't know much about him. Because I, I got to LSU in the late 90s and I, I was uh, a TA for the Louisiana history. And it seemed like he still had a pretty big presence. I mean, obviously, it helps if you're at LSU because, like you said, he built mm -hmm. some buildings and built the Capitol and everything. But again, I wonder if it's one of those things last 20, 25 years if the legacy is really dimmed, uh, with I the think longs. it has, I think it, yeah. and that's one of the reasons that I'm finishing up a book that'll be done by the end of this year. My next book is a, is a book about Yui Long and LSU. So it's okay. I'm hoping to educate some people around here about the role that Yui Long had in, in building this university. Okay. Wow. Another book by the end of the year. Yeah. Well, good for you, Bob. <laughs> um, cause again, I think he, like Wallace long, he does, He's very relevant now in terms of talking about, I hate to say, but authoritarianism and dictators yep. in the United States. For sure. And as you're working with, with Russell Long, are you learning more about him, not just your personal interactions, but kind of maybe going back in the, the archive, so to speak, to learn more about his voting record, things like that? 
uh, were the yeah, things one of the that, first, yeah, yeah. Well, ahead. you know, one of the first things I did is I realized I didn't know much about his father. I wanted to know uh, who he was, and you know, one of the ways you learn, especially somebody like Russell Long, if you want to know about him, you're gonna you want you need to know more about Huey Long. So I remember and having not having read the T. Harry Williams book at that point, okay. and uh, and getting that book and reading it and being fascinated and learning so much about it and still being still being really stupid about some of the stuff. I remember I'm in this bookstore. Um, second story books at DuPont Circle, um, still there. It was in my neighborhood where I lived. And I'm, um, I find a, a first edition signed copy of uh, Louisiana Hayride by uh, Harnett, T, uh, Harnett T. Kane, which was, you know, it was really about Huey Long's dictatorship and about the Louisiana scandals that came after Long died. And it resulted in the indictment of the president of LSU and the governor of Louisiana. And, uh, I, you know, I hadn't read it yet, so I didn't really know what it was about, but it, I think it, you know, the title it said something about the, the dictatorship of Huey Long or something like that. And I remember yeah, I go to, yeah. I go to work the next morning or on Monday morning and I'm walking somewhere with Senator Long and say, Hey, Senator, I want to tell you about this great book I just found over the weekend. I found a first edition copy signed by Harnett Kane of Louisiana Hayride. And he looked at me, <laughs> he looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why would I you know, what, what, what possibly could make me excited about that book? I, that book is all about how right. my father was a criminal, you know? And so I didn't, you know, I was still figuring it out, you know, just, I was, yeah. I was stupid. Well, but I, but you know, what, was, really, was, what I really, yeah. what I really learned about Russell Long was, you know, writing this book about him when I left his office, when he retired and I went to work for John Bro, and I had this idea to write a book and I want to write a book about you. And he agreed to work with me. And so then I spent four years just delving into his life, interviewing him, spent about 50 hours interviewing him and interviewed a lot of his colleagues and went through his papers and, you know, really immersed myself in his, in his life and got to know him a lot better after I was working for him than when I did. Well, that's, uh, you know, what I liked reading about backgrounds and bayous was I haven't really read much about Louisiana since I left in, in uh, 2005, but just like, you know, again, a uh, thing coming up with the, the mythical deduct box that Huey Long supposedly mm-hmm. had. Uh, there's like little, little things like that, that, that you talked about uh, were, were fun to, to get into again. And I think, you know, it's safe to say, as I said at the beginning, Louisiana has a colorful history, colorful politics, and sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes not such a good thing. You were really kind of on the ground floor in terms of the whole David Duke phenomenon in terms of trying to stop it, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I, I don't know how much people know about him now. He he was at the Charlottesville rally a few years ago and they've made movies about him and you see him in Black Klansman and everything. But he comes out of Louisiana. Maybe Maybe talk about sort of who he was and how you sort of got involved in terms of the, the campaign to, to stop him from, yeah. from rising to, off, well, to office. Yeah. Well, Duke was, um, was a, was a neo-Nazi and former leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, not originally from Louisiana. I think he was originally from Oklahoma, but he, he'd gone to LSU where he had distinguished himself as a pretty provocative, um, speaker in, in what we still call spe- free speech alley where he would make these go on these racist diatribes and and uh walked around campus in a you know in a brown shirt and you know just he was a he was a he was a horrible person and a, you know a, a vile racist who eventually gets elected to uh a house seat in uh suburban new orleans in metairie right in uh, the late 80s and uh you know sort of rocketed to national fame because of that it was you know a crazy time and um very shortly after that he runs for he briefly runs for president and then um and then he then in 1990 he decides to run for the US Senate against Bennett Johnston um and uh who had won pretty handily the last time he had run for for re-election and i think thought he was going to coast again to another re-election but quickly it, it becomes apparent that the, that the landscape in Louisiana has changed. And I write in the book how I naively thought that maybe we had, Louisiana had grown a little bit and we would sort of maybe put our racist past behind us. But we, you know, we realized that wasn't necessarily the case. And I was in Washington working as press secretary to, to John, Senator John Bro, And uh, my best friend um, on Capitol Hill, my former uh, roommate and somebody I had known in Shreveport uh, was Jim Oaks, who was 
been at Johnston's chief of staff and was going down to Louisiana to be uh, campaign manager for Johnston said, hey, you know, we're like, we need a press secretary. Why don't you come do it? And um, I was, you know, I, I, I was, it was, it seemed like a righteous cause and it was a reason to get back to Louisiana, more, spend a little more time in Louisiana, which I kind of missed it. And so, yeah, uh, I did. I went down, I went down and became Johnston's press campaign press secretary. And, um, and, you know, we realized very quickly that this is a real race. This isn't, we're not playing around here. This is, yeah. you know, this guy has a chance to win this race. Um, he didn't. Uh, but he didn't lose as as uh, Johnston did not win as a, as uh, uh, overwhelmingly. It wasn't as authoritative a win as we'd hoped. And we, you know, after it was over, we realized that 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 this Klansman, this former Klansman, this neo-Nazi, got about sixty percent of the white vote in our state. And he did it again the next year when he got into a runoff against Edwin Edwards for governor. And he, you know, he almost became governor of of this state. It was. It was a really rough four or five years in the state when, when we were constantly worried that, that a Klansman was going to take over state government and just drive, just pull the state under. Because yeah. if, you know, if you, if, you know, if you elect a Klansman as your governor, you're never going to get another Super Bowl. You never get another convention in New Orleans. You, people are going to start disinvesting in the state. We, you know, we weren't exactly a, you know, a Valhalla of, of economic activity to begin with. And it was, you know, it was going to be really bad for us. And, um, for all kinds, it wasn't just about the econ the economy of the state, by the way. It was, you know, just the morality of it. But eventually, it became the way that you beat him was not by telling people he was a racist because they already knew that, and that was a part of the reason why they were voting for him. At least white people. Uh, yeah, it yeah. was telling people if you vote for this racist, even though you like what he says, if you vote for him, make him governor, you're going to kill the state. And that was this, that was the thing that I think eventually persuaded at least, uh, you know, enough white people to to vote against him. Well, and and people knew what they were getting with Edwards, even if he was sort of an amoral, <laughs> uh, checkered candidate. He did know Louisiana, and I think um, just knowing something basic about you know where Louisiana's money was coming from in terms of petrochemical and stuff, that was like stuff that Duke didn't really have a, a handle on, right? I mean, no, he didn't. Yeah. In fact, he goes on. Um, you know, I remember I was sitting in my office and. Um, this was in the 1990 race. I was back. I was back in D.C. working for Bro, and I get this call from this producer at Meet the Press, and says, "Look, we're, we're, we're you know Duke's coming on Meet the Press on Sunday, and um, we're gonna we got some questions we're gonna ask him. Can you tell us who, who your state's largest employer is?" And I got the information for them, and um, I think it was Northrop Grumman, and I can't remember the other. It was it was three or four employers that were one, two, and three, and four, and I gave them this information, and sure enough, they asked Duke on the on the air live, who is your largest, who's your state's largest employer? And he had no idea. Yeah. And it really highlighted the fact that, that his, that his message was all about, you know, uh, social, um, you know, social policy, his racist message, you know, greet this, this racial grievance. He knew nothing about the state. He really had no idea about how to run the state. He didn't even know who the largest employer in the state. We hadn't bothered to learn who is, who the largest employer was. And it really started to expose him as, um, as really just a just a racist, not as somebody who was qualified to run the government, and enough people seem to care about that 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 uh, you know his 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 candidacy started to, to sag at that point. And I mean, it's you know of all people, Edwin Edwards, who desperately wanted to be in a runoff with him because he probably I think he figured out that was the only person he could beat. Um, and then of course mm. there were all these people who hated Edwards, but they hated Duke <laughs> more. And there were these bumper stickers that 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 sprung up around the state that said vote for the crook. It's important. And that was sort of the, that was sort of the attitude that a lot of people took into the voting booth, holding their nose, voting for the crook because the alternative was even worse. And Duke did end up going to prison anyway, didn't he? Yeah. A few years later, Duke uh, gets exposed for having built his supporters, raising money for supposedly his political campaigns, but using the money instead for, to, to satisfy his gambling debts. Okay. And yeah, and he, and he went to prison for I, I think it was tax evasion. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The the the, the irony there. Of, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I guess Edwards went to prison too eventually. Um, was, <laughs> yeah. And not only that, but Duke after he gets I think it's after he gets out of prison, he flees to Russia and he lives in Russia for three or four years. Oh and yeah. And gets involved in all this. He shows up at these. Um, Holocaust denial conferences and everything. Oh, and, God. you know, then he comes back and now he's back in Louisiana. Is it, and, yeah. 
you know, he ran for Congress a few years ago. He's still floating around and still causing trouble. Like you say, he showed up in Charlottesville a few years ago. Yeah. Did you at the time think th- this is maybe a sign of things to come on the right? Or do you just feel this is kind of an anomaly and Duke is a freak and it's all going to kind of blow over in terms of I, national influence? Yeah, I don't I don't I don't remember thinking that this is this is a sign of things to come. I mean, I don't, yeah. I, at the time I didn't, you know, in my mind draw a straight line between from David Duke to Donald Trump. I mean, in right. retrospect, you can see that clearly. Um, but at the time, I guess I thought it was um, just kind of a crazy, uh, I mean, you know, it's not every day, even in other places that Klan leaders are getting elected to, um, you know, to, to, to legislatures and almost and, and being credible candidates for, the U S Senate and governor. Yeah, I did. I did. I do remember thinking, however, I remembered that after we tried to expose, after we, after we tried to kill his candidacy by, by, we came up with all this stuff. Other people, you know, were a lot of people were giving us information about Duke. We had some video of him at a Klan rally at a, at a cross burning and a, and a, and a dressed up in his, in his Klan outfit in his hood, but you could hear his voice clearly shouting white power. By showing more and greater evidence evidence of his racism and his Nazism, and it didn't hurt him. It didn't hurt him. In fact, I think it verif- it certified him as a oh, this yeah. guy's a real racist. Okay, this is the guy we really right. want because he's the real thing, you know. And we were we realized, oh my God, we're actually maybe we're helping him by validating him even more as the real deal, as a racist, as a Nazi, as a as a yeah. And and so I remember coming away thinking that I just it it I realized that the that the Republican Party that that southern politics was you know very susceptible to these to these types and we've seen it ever since then you know that 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 duke may may have been one of the more extreme examples of it but we've seen you know we've seen a lot of people like him come along since then you know roy moore and you know just on and on and on and uh you know it's i think that and duke himself by the way duke himself yeah. even that we, we you know he was trying to he was trying to re- rehabilitate himself and, and walk back some of the more extreme stuff that he said. And I think maybe mistakenly because we were, and we were, we were actually helping him by saying, no, I know he's telling you he's not a racist, but he really is a racist. And we were inadvertently probably doing him a favor. It just, it was, it's kind of crazy to think that that was the case, but I, I believe it might've been. <laughs> well, I, and from what I know of him too, like he's not a foaming at the mouth kind of guy. I and mean, obviously what he says is reprehensible, but he. He was sort of a polished, soft-spoken in a lot of ways, like personable guy, not of that old school, obviously kind of a dangerous uh, figure that thankfully you know, Louisiana didn't, didn't vote him in. Hey, everybody, I want to just pause for a minute and tell you about the way that you can support this podcast. You can leave a five-star review on iTunes, which uh, helps people find the podcast And I don't know how that works, but uh, the more reviews, the better. At Amazon, you can buy my book there, Marching Masters, Slavery, Race, and the Confederate Army During the Civil War. And if you like the book, you can leave a five-star review. You can subscribe to this podcast on Spotify. And you can send me a question or comment. You can send that through Twitter. I'm Colin E. Woodward at Twitter. You can DM me there. I, I check Twitter fairly often pretty much every day at least a few times a day so your messages will be read and appreciated as always thank you for listening and thank you for support now let's get back to the show one thing i liked about the book is that you you talk like what you just said in terms of maybe what we were saying as truth truthful as it was about him being a racist and a nazi could backfire on us because people might be like, well, I want to vote for the racists. And so Duke is, is my man. And so, yeah, I liked how you sort of, you bring up these issues and, and maybe even with, with hindsight, you can't necessarily say, well, this is what we should have done. I mean, cause what you, what Edwards did do, it, it did work. So at some level, you know, all's well, that ends well. Um, but I think in terms of like a primer for some, I mean, this book would be great in terms of if you're on a campaign or you want to be a politician or, or be a consultant to a politician, you have to think about these things very, very deeply, I think. Um, and it's, it seems like you did that again and again. And 
in terms of polit- politically, the way Louisiana is set up, like with the open primary, where you could have two Democrats going into a runoff or two Republicans, it's not necessarily Republican versus Democrat. Do you think that helped someone like Duke or do you think it, it doesn't really matter? And that's kind of unique to Louisiana, right? Is that the only state that does I think that? Maybe California has some sort of open primary system as well. But, okay. but Louisiana is one of the few, if not the only, that has that where, where it's conceivable that the two top vote getters in the primary could be Republican or Democrat and you could have a runoff with it doesn't it, you know, you it often happens that you do have a Republican and a Democrat in the runoff because we do still right. do have a sizable Democratic vote in this state. But um but it's but for Duke, for example, I think that, you know, if he had had to run in a in a Republican primary, it would have even raised the stakes more for the Republican Party. Um, and there would have been there wouldn't have been, you know, a lot of these these white Democrats who still who are still registered to vote as Democrats wouldn't have been available to vote for him um, because I think he benefited by a lot of by a lot of Democratic votes, um, because in this state, because yeah. there's no primary, it doesn't really force these historic these people who have historically who've been registered as Democrat all their life to go down and switch parties because it doesn't matter because there's no party primary. So it doesn't they can it's not really urgent to go change your party registration because you can still participate in the same way. And Duke was a, he was a Democrat and then switched he had been to a Democrat, Republican right. Party. And then switched to Republican um, right before he ran for the state house. Okay. Yeah. So you, you're, you know, we're talking about this realignment that happens and I don't know, seventies and eighties, certainly when you're seeing Democrats switch over to the Republican party, a lot of it because of the civil rights movement and, and things like that. But Duke certainly, uh, comes out of that. And when I got to Louisiana, I think it was a, it seemed like it was a pretty quiet time. I think when I moved there, Murphy, Murphy J. Foster, Mike Foster, he was the governor. And it seemed like Louisiana was kind of cruising along. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, wedge issues. It didn't seem like I mean, until you get to 9-11 and then obviously uh, things, things change oh, there. But um, you end up working for for Governor Blanco. Maybe talk about her, how you got that job, and and we'll get to Katrina. But just kind of first talk about how you got to know her and got that. Well, job. I had known Kathleen Blanco for many years, uh, just around Louisiana politics. She had been a state representative, uh, public service commissioner, and then lieutenant governor. And so you know, if you I was working for for John Bros, his press secretary, traveling around the state with him, and we wound up at events with the Blancos all the time. And so I got to know him and his, uh, her and his, and her wife and her husband, coach Raymond Blanco pretty well. And she gets in a runoff and um, she runs for governor in 2003, gets in a runoff with Bobby Jindal, open primary Democrat Republican, you know, and um, it looks like Jindal's going to win pretty handily. And so um, she, I don't know how, I've never asked bro how exactly how it happened, but I get this phone call one day from bro and he says, hey, look, I just got off the phone with Kathleen and I'm sending you over to work for, for her for the next through the through the, you know, through the runoff. And I said, oh, man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go work on another campaign. I don't like myself on campaigns. You know, I just I don't want to do that. Yeah. Don't make me. And he said, just go do it. You'll it'll take you six weeks and you'll be back. And so I went and, I, and we ended up winning the race. And the first I was the first person she offered a job to that night. And um I turned it down. I, I accepted it. Then I turned it down. Then I reconsidered and took the job and ended up working for her as her communications director. And, you know, I love Kathleen Blanco and I, and I loved her husband, coach. They're wonderful people. And it was, a, it was an incredible experience uh, working for a governor, having spent so many years working in the legislative branch, finally having experience seeing, you know, how the other side worked, how, you know, working for an executive department, working for an executive officer and just, you know, having that experience was was priceless, and I'm I'm glad I did it. Uh, Katrina changed everything, and obviously, I probably if it hadn't yeah. for Katrina, I probably would have continued working for her, and I wouldn't have this wonderful life at LSU. It kind of, you know, shook everything up and forced me to make a change, and I'm glad I did. Um, but but uh, but I write a lot about Katrina because it was that it was that sort of you know it was it it, it is a defining moment in the state's politics and its history for sure and she was first female governor of louisiana right. correct right so historic for that reason and she's elected uh, remind me what year 2002 she was elected 2003 she's and elected? took office in, in january 2004. okay okay so it's a couple uh, she has a couple of years before katrina where she's she 
she was able to get th- some things done, right? Um, right. Legislatively. Yeah, she was having a yeah. good. She was having a very good run. She had dedicated herself to economic development and was much more active than than Mike Foster, her her predecessor, was at that, and was getting some high marks for attracting some some big you know big name industries into this into the state, to make, make you know making some other reforms. Just you know, I think doing a doing a very good job as governor and 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 i think her and i I know her popularity was was pretty high going into into katrina and then so there was this pre-katrina administration of blanco which was focused primarily on education reform and economic development and then there was post-katrina which was pretty much all about recovering from katrina and rita by the way you know people forget that hurricane rita slammed into the lake charles area a month later and it was really a, a, a you know, a, a, a one-two punch for Louisiana that year. Yeah. No, it was, it was a bad time. And uh, just to back up for a second, I, I did like your coverage of the of the campaign against Jindal. Again, when you're kind of talking about decisions, it seems like Jindal, even though he didn't really have much, he, he'd never been to elected office, right, right before. Well, no, he had been, and, uh, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, let's see, he, he, had he served in Congress at that time? I think he, after that, he... When served in Congress. Okay, okay. Um, but he sort of seemed like he thought he was going to cruise to victory. He did. And you kind of kept the heat up in terms of Blanco's campaign, kind of going negative, essentially. I mean, that's that's what you did. Yeah. But but attacking his record. Yeah, well, he had been... And that seemed to he work. He had been the uh, health secretary for Mike Foster, in which he was sort of Foster's hatchet man and cutting, slashing the med- you know the medicaid program and the state the you know this this state's we have a state charity hospital system in the state and he had really hurt a lot of people you know really hurt a lot of people he and foster and he was foster's guy and he did it enthusiastically so uh and then he goes off to, to washington and serves as a deputy secretary for the department of uh, health and human services under george bush and sort of burnishes his bona fides as a as a healthcare guy, you know, and so he was running as a guy who really knew a lot about healthcare and was going to reform Louisiana's healthcare system. So we went after him, you know, we attacked his strength, which was to expose the weaknesses of this and, and show the damage that he had done and, and point out that if he's, if he becomes governor, he can do a lot more damage and he probably will. And people that resonated with people. And and one juicy bit in the book was you, you had the story about Jindal doing an exorcism when he was in college. Yeah. You, <laughs> you want to talk about well, that? You know, so I don't know. It was about three weeks before the election. I just get this envelope that somebody mails to my house. I still had no idea who sent it to me. I don't have a clue who sent this to me. Okay. It sort of appeared in my mail, and it was these two articles that had been printed in a um, a public a, a conservative Catholic publication. I think it was called the New Oxford Review, and it was two articles that Jindal had written early, many years earlier. And uh, one of them was about um, a, an experience that he had had when he was a, an undergraduate at Brown University in which he described in very vivid detail participating in what only can be called an exorcism. And then there was this yeah. other article that he, that he attacked Protestants as being godless or something. I don't know. It was, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it was an attack on Protestantism. But the, the okay. holy smokes, this is like, this dude's describing... <laughs> An exorcism, you know, and so I go, I go into overdrive trying to, you know, pitch it to West yeah. because I thought it was pretty newsworthy, but it was so late in the campaign that no one would touch it. No one would touch it. And okay. this was before the days of blogs and, you know, we didn't have any, there was no such thing as social media. So I had no other outlet for it. So it just, it, yeah. we, he, he got, he, we, we went through the race, we won the race, but no one ever brought it up. It never got into the, it never got into the public until he ran for reelection. And then it was, it did, then it didn't really matter that much. Okay. Yeah, that was that was wild. I mean, even in Catholic Louisiana, that's pretty yeah. extreme uh, a story. And I mean, with Katrina, obviously that's it's a very tragic event, a complicated event. So I can't get into all the weeds there with that. But maybe just sort of talk about the response on Blanco's end, and you know what she did right. Maybe what didn't go so well for you. I mean, obviously there's this tension between. Uh, the new New Orleans government, Louisiana government, federal response, uh, as as best you can, maybe just just kind of boil it down in terms of how you and, and the governor responded to all that and how it well, went. Well, the thing that I always tell people about Katrina 
and I, I think I try to communicate it in this book is that, you know, it's not, a, it wasn't a disaster. A disaster is one thing. A disaster is what we had with Ida. You know, it was, this was a catastrophe and, there, and a disaster yeah. is a different thing than a catastrophe. A catastrophe is when, you know, even, even in the worst part of Ida, we could communicate, the governor of Louisiana could communicate with the mayor of New Orleans. In Katrina, the governor of Louisiana could not communicate with the mayor of New Orleans because all communications between those two cities were completely shattered. I was with her on a couple of occasions when the only way she could talk to the mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagin, was to get on a helicopter and fly to New Orleans and try to find him because there was, she couldn't, there was no phone communications. It's crazy to think about that. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. But it was, you know, if you think about how difficult it would be to coordinate a, a federal, state, and local response to something like Katrina when the mayor of the state and the governor, or the mayor of the city and the governor of the state can't communicate with each other. And so, you know, just magnify that, just, you know, just, um, and, and, and just spread it out throughout the region. Um, yeah. It made it really, really hard to respond in that first couple of weeks. And I think that, that poor response that was partly the, 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 the fault of the government at every level for not being adequately prepared, but also just because it was impossible to communicate. Um, and because I think the federal government didn't take it as seriously as they should have. I mean, we know, we all know how, Bush delayed coming to New Orleans and the, his, the federal government sort of downplayed the severity of Katrina for, for way too long. And, um, you know, you throw all that into the mix, it just looked like total chaos at every level. And people decided that everybody from the governor to the mayor to the president were equally wrong and equally responsible for the disaster, for the, you know, for the, for the, for the disastrous response. And I think what I write in the book, and I think, I think history bears, you know, I think history supports this, that people have reassessed in Louisiana and they don't, they, they certainly realize now that, that Katrina was a man-made disaster. It was a failure of these federal levies that, that was the real problem. And it, 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 that if the levies had, if the levies had held and the city hadn't been submerged for months, uh, it would have been a different, it would have been different. Katrina would have been a different yeah. story. Well, and as you say in the book, even when the governor would take a helicopter down to new orleans after this the storm she couldn't find where nagin was i yeah. mean he's just gone yeah we were we, i fly with um, her one day down there we land at the superdome drive over just around the corner to city hall and the mayor the mayor's nowhere to be found we, we later learned that he had yeah. fled to dallas he bought a house in dallas and was spending a lot of his time <sighs> wow having set up his family in another city can you imagine a, the mayor of a city that's been hit by katrina just abandoning the city and moving to dallas um, you know, but that's what he did. And that's, uh, that's why it was yeah. so hard to, to find because he wasn't there. Well, and he, he ran into some legal problems later himself, uh, Nagin. Yep. And it, I moved out of Louisiana just before the storm hit, but just, you know, the things we were hearing were just so awful at every level. And in terms of the federal response, you kind of didn't know where the incompetence ended and the malice began. Like, are they just playing politics here and not giving Louisiana what they needed. And it's, and it seemed like the governor, she certainly did not want to pick a fight with Washington. No. And I wanted was, her to, you know, because they were attacking us. Yeah. They were coming after us, trying to make us look incompetent. They were spreading, you know, misinformation. Like for example, the Washington post and newsweek relying on a white house source, who I think was probably Carl Rove told them that the governor was so incompetent that she hadn't declared a state of emergency, which, which she had done three days before the storm hit. And they bought it. Yeah. The press bought it. And so uh, there was a level of um, uh, malevolence toward us that the, that the national press was buying. And I wanted to fight back. I and others wanted to fight back. But, but the governor wisely, I think, said, we're not going to get into this war with the White House because down the road, three or four months, we're going to need their help. We're going to need we're going to be up there asking them for all this money to rebuild. And I don't want to be at war with George Bush. Let him say what he wants to about us. Um in the short term, that's going to be really bad for us. But in the long term, it'll it'll accrue to our benefit. And it and it did. She was she was wise enough to to see that. And I I was not. Well, it seemed like one thing that you you were critical of, and maybe this is a, kind of a personality thing with the governor. But you made it seem like she was doing a lot of press conferences, maybe too many, when she didn't exactly have a full grasp of the facts and kind of what was going on. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I mean, she was doing a lot. 
we were we, I, we were we succumbed to the pressure to do more briefings every day than we probably should have. It didn't need to be the governor out there in, in every briefing being the the, the the spokesperson for everything that was going on in the state. We could have easily had one briefing a day and had the head of the National Guard and the state police and wildlife and fisheries and health and hospitals and all those other people doing their own briefings. And the governor didn't need to be the only source of information. So, but but we sort of succumbed to that demand for her um, by the press and others that she be seen and she be out there active and seen in control. And sometimes I think we sent her out there with, you know, when she was a little less prepared than she should have been. And that was my fault for not sort of just putting the, the brakes on it and saying, no, we're not, you know, we're not going to overexpose her. But even when I tried, I write, I write in the book about how I tried to, I did try to do that on occasion. One day, you know, Jesse Jackson appears at the, um, he'd been down in New Orleans and he drove up to, to Baton Rouge, he wanted to meet with the governor, and uh, I go out to meet him before he goes in to see the governor. And he says, "Look, when I when I meet with the governor, I'm going to ask her if she will join me in this press conference that I'm going to hold here." And uh, so I go in to see the governor and say, "Governor, you're, before you meet with Reverend Jackson, he's going to ask you to do this press conference. Let me tell him no for you, so you don't have to offend him. I'll just tell him. Let me work. Let me let me protect you here." So she says, "Fine." So yeah. Jackson comes in, we do this meeting, and at the end of it, he says, now, Governor, I'm going to go out and do this little press briefing, and I'd love for you to join me at the podium. And I say, Reverend, I know she would love to, but we haven't had time to prepare her, and it just wouldn't be good. She's going to be asked a lot of questions she doesn't, she's not going to have the answers to, and it'd be better, if you don't mind, if you could just do that without her. And he goes, oh, that's fine. It's perfectly fine. I understand. And, and Blanco goes, well, God, you know, I, I think I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go out there with you. And it's like, ah you know i had you, yeah. had you covered and you still didn't let me do it you know so <laughs> maybe i should have been a little kinder to myself because you know i did there were times when i tried and it still didn't work yeah well that's a tricky yeah. thing politically you you want to be sort of out there and be the public face but you don't want to be unprepared you don't right. want to be intrusive either right. and i that, you know one problem with trump is like he's out there all the time and doing press yes. conferences and didn't know what he was talking right. about obviously right. um and it might help his ego, but, you know, I think people are just, their mouths are up like, what the hell did he just say? That's, I mean, that's just, exactly right. Uh, unbelievable. Um, so, I mean, do you think to a certain degree there's just uh, only so much she could have done? I mean, given the lack of coordination between city, state, federal, um, the kind of general incompetence of the of the Bush presidency, could it have gone a whole lot better, you think? Or was this just such an overwhelming thing that she probably did about the best she could do? Well, I think we did about the best we could. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, there were a couple of times when I think that we could have. So there's this, this example I think I've talked about in the book where the FEMA people were embedded with us. So there was this conference room right next to the governor's office, big sort of operations, emergency operations center. And these FEMA people were sitting at the table with us. And so, you know, they were... It wasn't a situation where we were having to make phone calls to Washington saying, hey, this is Louisiana calling and here's what we need from Washington right now. <laughs> right. Here's how many generators and how many truckloads of ice and how much fuel and this, that and the other we need. The FEMA people were in the office with us. They were sitting at the table and we were still not getting the help we needed. But when we would ask for it, they would, you know, what? they would say, well, you didn't make the, the proper request. You didn't ask for the right things and all that. And we would say, your job is to tell us what to ask for. We don't know what you have. We don't know what you can provide us today or next week. You need to be telling us what we need to be asking you for. What are you doing? What are you here for? Why are you even in the room if that's not your job? And so they would blame us for not requesting the right stuff. And my response was, well, tell us what you want us to say. Tell us what the magic words are, and we'll use those words because we need this help right now. But I think they were able to malign Louisiana and the governor in particular for not asking, using the right words or asking for the right things. And they, we would say, well, you know, we need this stuff. And they would say, well, you haven't asked for it yet. Or you haven't, we don't have this form in triplicate. And, um, you know, we, we did our best, I think. I think th there is, there's one anecdote in the book where you do, you do mention when you first, I think you first meet the head of FEMA mm -hmm. and it's as, it's off to a bad start right from the get go. I can't remember what what he said exactly, but it was just sort of this um, conceited 
condescending response that he had about uh, what was happening. And yeah. he was speaking very, uh, yeah, condescending is, a, is the right way to put it. The way he was speaking to Governor Blanco was really turned me off. And I realized, at the time, I, mean, I, I remember thinking, I distinctly remember thinking that Mike Brown is a, is a bullshit artist. He's a blowhard and a bullshit artist. Yeah. And it turns out that's exactly what he was. And I'm not, I don't claim to be the most perceptive person in the world, but that guy was screaming bullshit artist. Yeah, well, you know, his boss was a lot like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, obviously a lot of politicians can be that way. But um, and, and unfortunately, too, I mean, I was up here in, in Richmond when it was all going on. And I even met a guy who was from Louisiana. I, didn't, I can't remember from where exactly, but he was just kind of like, ask room if they want to live in a bathtub, they're going to get wet. So there's this just sort of callous indifference a lot of people like well you live in a city that's under sea level or or whatever they would say and so you know what are we supposed to do they have a hurricane you know um it's their own fault so right on top of the tragedy that was very sad and unfortunate to see a lot of public opinion that way and i think again you know looking back is maybe sort of a sign of things to come where there's just a sort of lack of empathy and, you know, we're a union of 50 states, but there's just developed this us versus them mentality. Um, and just they obviously didn't get the help that, that they needed uh, down there. And and for you, that was sort of it, right? I mean, after you work with, with Blanco, you say, I'm, I'm done doing this. Well, yeah, I mean, I was I think that I my usefulness to her had sort of run its course and um yeah. And I realized that I was being sort of cut out of some meetings and they lost, they'd lost confidence in me. I, I, I'm, I'm very honest about it in the book. I think they lost confidence. She lost confidence yeah. in me and maybe for good reason, you know, maybe I wasn't the person she needed at that time. Um, but I was also, even before then I was, you know, I had right before I went to work for her, I had, was about to sign a contract for a, for another book that I never ended up, that I never ended up completing or writing, but it was a, I was about to, I turned down a lot of money for this book, a pretty big advance. And um, I really wanted to keep writing books. I really wanted to keep doing what I love to do, which is, which is, you know, write about political history. And, um, and I had been, even before then, I had been teaching as an adjunct here at LSU at the school where I now teach full time. And I knew I loved it. I knew I loved being in the classroom. I thought I was pretty good at it. And, um, and this job came open um, in the, early, early spring of 2006. And I applied for it and, and got the job and I've been here ever since. And I've never been happier in my life than, than I am to, than to, to teach and have the freedom to write books. And, you know, I get paid for doing this. I don't have to do it in my off, you know, my, as a side, yeah, as a sideline to my job, I get paid to do it. And I get a lot of really good support from LSU to underwrite my, my research. And so it's, 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 really been a lot of fun and I love, I love what I do. Well, that's great. So had you been thinking about writing a book like this for a while, kind of a memoir, yeah, I, I guess. I, I found myself it. telling stories to people and, you know, I realized, wow, I've got a lot, I've got some pretty fun stories, you know? And then, uh, so I, I really yeah. started to write the book, um, just to sort of as a collection of stories and telling, telling the story of some of the people that I'd worked with. Cause I thought that would be interesting. And it wasn't until I got it, I didn't start out thinking that it would be so reflective and that I would examine myself as much as I did um, and be as raw and honest as it, I think it, it came, it turned out to be, but I just felt like if I was going to, that I didn't want to be the hero of my story. That didn't seem to be very interesting or, you know, truthful. So I felt like if I'm going to be honest about other people, I need to be honest about myself. And it was a really good exercise. Uh, as you know, I, I dedicated the book to a, a friend of mine who I betrayed and and I destroyed our friendship in the last year of his life. He died of cancer and we never we never saw each other again, uh, even though we spoke briefly before his death. Um, and I wanted the book to be something that people might read and say, God, don't let me make these mistakes. Don't let me destroy friendships and betray people. And, you know, don't 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 let politics lead you astray to the point that you do some of the stuff that Bob Mann did. And um, I mean, I'm not, I don't think the book is, I don't think the, I'm not describing criminality or totally rotten behavior, but, but I don't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to pretend that I made all the right decisions every, at every turn and that I was the, you know, the virtuous person in the story, which I'm, I wasn't. 
Yeah, no, I I think it's it's a pretty it's an honest book, but it's also fair. I mean, yeah, you're not whoever you I mean, I don't know about Duke, but I mean, you, the people you worked with, you definitely point out some flaws, but also what they really excelled at. I mean, someone like Russell Long, mm-hmm. you know, you're very honest about about him. He had a drinking problem, but he was also a very skilled politician, uh, despite the fact that he had this legacy. I mean, just on his own terms, he was he was very good. So. No, I mean, that's what I liked about it. Um, you, you do tell these stories and, and give us a sense of kind of the nature of politicians generally. I mean, even someone like Edwards, who was so successful, I know he had his, he had problems with corruption and everything, but kind of in private, he was he was kind of a withdrawn guy, right? I mean, he could really get up there and play to the crowd, but personally, he was sort of withdrawn, right? Yeah, he was. He was a... I don't know if you call him an introvert, but when we, when, you know, yeah. in, in private, he was quiet. He would, um, I, you know, I think maybe another part of it, and I don't know if I wrote about this in the book because it's kind of occurred to me since then, but, you know, what I've learned a little bit about studying introverts, and I have some in my family, is that it takes so much energy to, to get up there on the stage and perform and be and pretend to be an extrovert. Then when you get off the stage, you go back into private, You're all you can do is just sort of collapse and uh, lie down and recharge your batteries because it takes so much out of you. Yeah. And I think maybe there was something of that to Edwards that the reason that he was a little bit of withdrawn in private is because it took so much energy to do the uh, the public part of it. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm veering into psychoanalysis and that's not something that I'm skilled at, but, no, but, I, but it, was, it, yeah. just, it was an interesting, an interesting part of his, he, he, he didn't just, chatter on and you know was it hail fellow well met the whole time that was that was that was largely an act i think or at least a part of his public persona that wasn't part of his private persona yeah no I mean, that's in interesting i don't want to say he couldn't charm in private he certainly could right no i think there's a certain amount of theater or just you know they got they have to do what they have to do when they're yep. on they're on stage right. essentially and it, it can be very draining um i mean certainly there are politicians as you can see a pathology there where they just cannot stop, you know, performing. Mm -hmm. Um, But even, even, you know, some of the biggest people in political history that in private, they're maybe either kind of soft-spoken or just kind of plain boring. It's really when they're giving a speech is kind of when they come alive. So that, that's one thing I really liked about it. So again, yeah, congratulations on the book. It's, it's very good. I guess maybe my last question or or maybe two questions is is kind of a bigger picture thing um, you've lived in Louisiana a long time. You've you've been at the heart of the the political game. Maybe this is a loaded question, but like, will will Louisiana ever really change? Mm. Is I guess is this question I still think about uh, either with Louisiana or whatever state you live in. Like, if you're a progressive person, in Louisiana is it is it going to change that much, or just it, it is what it yeah. is? Yeah. Well, you know, I I, I wrote the the, uh, the book doesn't really deal too much with my my Louisiana, uh, my, my time post Louisiana politics, but for five years, I wrote a column for the New Orleans Picayune, New Orleans Times Picayune on politics. And uh, in 2017, I wrote a column that still gets kind of circulated around. And I posted every once in a while myself, just to remind people that I took this stance and I still believe it. And the, the headline was Louisiana is, let's face facts, something like that. Louisiana is sick and dying. And you know, I just sort of, it was sort of an indictment of the state and it's uh, as a benighted place that just is never going to change because we don't aspire to anything but mediocrity here. We're satisfied with good enough and, um, you know, we're last in everything that's good and first in everything that's bad. And we seem to be fine with that as long as we don't have to cancel too many Mardi Gras and uh, the Tigers yeah. are winning football games and maybe the Saints too. Um, you know, it's bread and circuses. And um, I don't, you know, I, I'd love to say I see some evidence that things are that things are changing, that people have higher expectations, but I'd be lying. I don't see any evidence that people, what I see evidence of is that people who, who really want a, to live in a better place and can afford to do it have realized they've got to move because this place isn't going to ever give them what they want. Yeah, they call it the brain drain right. and people that the ink is dry, barely dry in their degrees and they're going somewhere yeah. else. And then unfortunately there's, there's the, the situation with me, I got my PhD and I moved on and it was just, it was just a frustrating place because 
yeah, it's culturally strong, but sort of politically not so much because you know New Orleans has tourism, has jazz, has all this great food and culture, but politically it's just kind of a mess, honestly. Um, as you say, the the good categories really need some work there. Um, but I've lived in Arkansas. And you're kind of <laughs> dealing with the same issues there. You live in Mississippi, kind of it's a Gulf Coast, Deep South, whatever uh, issue. Um, but okay, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, and again, when when a hurricane comes through, if it does major damage, just sort of sets everything back. They got to rebuild, and I, I don't know. It's just it's just almost like this first world, third world country, you know, um, oh, yeah. that just can't seem to get on track yeah these hurricanes um, really sort but, of lay bare a lot of our problems too you know they really expose a lot yeah you know, and we're seeing it right now with just the infrastructure how fragile and non-existent it is right and okay so my, and my last question is you know obviously we've we've been through quite an ordeal the last four or five years with with trump and this partisanship is just unreal have you seen anything like this and do you see it getting better in the near future I've not seen anything like it. I don't think we've seen any, I don't think any living person has seen anything like this. Uh, I think we've seen this in our, obviously in our, in our nation's history. We, it's been worse, yeah. civil war, obviously, but it does seem as, as worse as it's, as it's been in anybody's, uh, any living person's memory. And I don't see it getting better. I mean, I wish I could, I wish I saw it getting better, but it feels like that, that our system is not set up to deal with some of our most serious problems. I mean, we're just, you know, um, there's a lot of beauty in, in our governmental system, our, the way our federal government is set up and our federalist system. There's a lot of, there's a lot to be said for it, but I think it also, I think we're seeing in the last uh, 20, 30 years, the, the severe weaknesses of that as how scholaric we are and just how the, the system that we have is, is designed to magnify the influence of rural states, more conservative states. You know, we're seeing the Senate become less and less representative of the of the public at large. It was never meant to be truly representative, but it's become so unrepresentative that it's, yeah. it's the Senate, I think, that worries me as much as anything. Hmm. You know, just the inability to get things done and to, uh, that, that if, if politics can no longer even when you win an election, if, if you cannot, if the, if politics doesn't result in, in some sort of expression of the, of the will of the people, then people are going to give up on politics. And what, and what I worry about is that what we saw on the, on the right on January 6th may end up morph into civil unrest on both sides, not a civil war, but I worry that this is that the logical conclusion of this is sort of some sort of civil unrest that, that doesn't resolve itself for a long time. Yeah. Hope I'm wrong. Well, and uh, <laughs> no, me too. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm 46, but I've never felt as bad about politics as I do right now, even with 9 11 and the Iraq invasion, and everything. I mean, that was all bad, but like, it just seems like just sort of a daily oppressive grind of just like the politics is just so intrusive at every level, and you just can't really escape it because partly because of social media. Um, but also, you know, we just we were with four years of a president who's on TV all the time, on Twitter all the time, and you just can't escape it. And everybody's just pissed off all the time. It doesn't matter who you are, Democrat, Republican. And so it's just sort of like the national mood. I've, I've never seen it like this. Um, and just some people, they get raged. Other people just plain get depressed. And it's sort of like trying to navigate between that, those two extremes in addition to all these other things that we, like you said, like infrastructure, the economy, uh, healthcare, like all these sort of bread and butter issues are, are, are not getting dealt with because of just the extremes and the rhetoric uh, and, you know, politicizing everything down to mask wearing during a pandemic. Right. I mean, it's just, um, it's just been really oppressive. So I don't know. Do you have kind of good days and bad days? <laughs> <laughs> Some days you're just like, maybe you should, uh, check out and yeah. think about Canadian citizenship. Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Don't we all? I mean, I think I yeah. think I do. Part of me wants to to bail out of here, bail out of Louisiana. And you know, yeah. part of me wants to stay here and fight. Um, part of me, I think a large part of me wants to just 
uh, unplug and maybe not um, yeah. be as voracious a consumer of the daily news as I am and maybe step back and take a broader perspective of what's going on, um, then it might be healthier for my, it might be healthier for my emotion, better for my emotional health, but it might be better for all of us to, you know, to not get so enraged about every little every little thing take a big, big, big yeah. broader view that's that's spoken from a position of privilege though because i'm not one of i'm not a minority that's being attacked every day and so i've got to be careful about that too because there are people that are whose rights are worth fighting for and i don't want to be one of those people who retreats into my privilege and and leaves the, the field to to their to the enemies of the of the underprivileged i i've been trying to step back a little bit too in terms of how much I'm on Twitter, how much I'm watching the news, because again, the politics is bad enough, but with the pandemic, it's just like a Katrina every day or every other mm -hmm. day in terms of uh, loss of life. So that's bad enough unto itself. But then I think, well, if you're, if you're sort of checking out, you're sort of copping out. And then I feel guilty about ignoring these things that are happening, but also there's a frustration of well, what can I do? What can I do about what's happening in Florida or Texas or even in California with the recall vote. Like I know they say you won by a fair margin, but people were nervous leading up to that. So if it's not at home, it's somewhere else you got to worry about. And so, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any, everybody wants to save the world. No one wants to help mom do the dishes. And right. you know, maybe <laughs> we need to focus on where we can make a real difference. I can't do anything about the filibuster probably. You know, I can call my I can call my right. senators and tell them what I think, but they don't care. But I but I can yeah. have I do have some influence in in my in my community in my state and that's where I'm increasingly deciding to focus my my activism and my efforts at changing things closer to home where I have a little bit more power and influence. Yeah. And I think just staying on it in terms of every election I mean, don't take mm -hmm the local election for granted state now, you know, whatever, like you, people just got to go out and vote and, and they got the vote out in 2020 on the democratic end. And so that was encouraging, but still razor thin margins in the Senate and the house. And you just don't know what's going to happen. That's um, right. So, okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's good to talk to people about these kinds of things. Cause some days I feel like I'm overreacting, but then, you will talk to some people who are like, holy shit, I'm moving to Canada. You know, like I'm ready to go. Um, so I'm ch I, and I don't have that luxury. I mean, I, I just can't get up and move. And I don't think you know most people can. So we just got to to work through it. But yeah, I, I mean, Bob, I just want to, again, congratulate you on this book. I can't believe you have another one. What What's the one that's coming out again? Well, it's called the, uh, Kingfish U, uh, How Huey Long uh, Made the Modern LSU. So it's the story of Huey Long okay. in the 19, late 20s and 30s, how he turned LSU into a little minor cow college into, uh, you know, what I think at the time was a pretty significant university with a national profile. Absolutely. And you said that's 2021? That's That'll be out, out uh, toward the end, end of next year. And then next year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, um, good luck with that. Okay. And yeah, everybody should read Backrooms and Bayous. I really enjoyed it. So I'll let you get to lunch or whatever, Bob. Uh, but thanks for taking the time. It was really great talking to you. Thank you so much. You. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Bob. Take care. All right. That was my talk with Robert Mann. I hope you enjoyed that. And sorry, it cut off just a little bit at the end there. Uh, I'm not sure why, uh, but just as Bob was saying, he enjoyed the conversation, cut out a little bit. So my apologies for that. But we were done. And once again, want to thank Bob for talking with me. And the book is Backrooms and Bayous, My Life in Louisiana Politics. It is available. You can get it on Amazon. And if you like politics, you like political history, you will enjoy reading that. This has been American Rambler. I'm Colin Woodward. You can support the podcast by following me on Spotify. And you can get all the podcasts there and on iTunes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Colin E. Woodward. And you can buy my book, Marching Masters, Slavery, Race, and the Confederate Army during the Civil War, available through University of Virginia Press. Going for $39.95 on Amazon, but you can get a cheaper copy from me. Just DM me on Twitter. I will sign it for you. I will send it to you. Nothing you have to do on your part other than uh, send me a check. And the Kindle version is a little bit cheaper on Amazon, a few bucks cheaper. So if you want to read the digital copy, 
You can also get it on Kindle. I'm recording this on the night of the big playoff game between the Red Sox and the Yankees. It is being played at Fenway Park, so Fenway is going to be rocking. I'm sure it will be a full house there, and Boston will be really cranked up. You can't get much more classic than a Red Sox-Yankees playoff game, and this is the first time there's ever been a one-game playoff in the wild card format. You'd have to go back to 1978 when there was a one-game playoff between the Red Sox and the Yankees, but that was way before the expanded playoffs. And it's a notorious series because of Bucky Dent hitting that home run over Fenway. So hopefully it won't go down like that. Uh, but I think the Red Sox have a good chance. I mean, obviously they had the same record. The Red Sox slightly beat the Yankees in the series between them. Uh, I think they won 10 to the Yankees 9 uh, over the course of the season when they played each other. But uh, the Yankees played better in the second half. So it's, it should be a good game. I hope. Uh, I'm not sure who's pitching for the Sox. Uh, Sale pitched the other day, so he'll be unavailable. Might be Eovaldi. I'm not sure who's starting. But I will be watching. 8 o'clock start, so it might be a late one. Probably a classic four, four four-and-a-half-hour game because there is no tomorrow if you don't win. So uh, the, the Red Sox have their work cut out for them against the Rays or some other teams if they do make it past this this one game series with the Yankees you know one day at a time and hopefully the the bats will be hot tonight and the pitching will be good um and they can beat the Yankees on their home ground so I will be glued to the TV tonight all right I will be talking with you soon take care bye <laughs>